Robert Downey Jr. claims it's part of his process. Mm, that's clever. It's just so mind blowing. People really want to be on TV, don't they? Yeah. She is a monster. Yeah, but she's but, good. Uh, my monster. Yeah, but, she's but, very good at her job. <laughs> God, what a sucker! They think they they've won these people, but they haven't. They've lost. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Rest is Entertainment Questions and Answers edition. I'm Marina Hyde. And I'm Richard Osman. Shall we get on with some questions? Please do. Rob Henson has a question, Marina. He said, I wonder if authors and screenwriters are compelled by publishers and producers to use American English to appeal to the largest audience. For example, an English character saying they're putting something in the trunk of their car rather than the boot. First of all, I would say that to some extent... The nation that pays the writer is getting their version of the language used. If Americans are paying, you're going to say ass and not ass. But you're, what you'll probably do, if you're trying to put that word in the mouth of an English character, you know that any English person watching it is going to think it looks stupid because we don't we say ass and not ass. Yeah. So you'll probably avoid that. Funnily enough, when we were working on the franchise the whole time, luckily we had some Americans. So when you're doing stuff really quickly on set, we would constantly ask my friend Julie Wiener, who's brilliant, so funny, do Americans say this? And she'd be like, what? The one thing that she found completely difficult, by the way, is that quite means something totally different in America. I would be like, what? No, it doesn't. You know, you're gas, gas quieting us, if you will. Apparently, quite in America means a lot. So when we'd say... She'd say, oh, is, and is it good? And we'd be like, yeah, it's quite good. She'd be like, oh, great. So it, <laughs> genuinely, quite means something different in American. What? And her great friend, when he'd been writing on Succession, was like, oh, yeah, well, I had that trouble with them all. I didn't know what they're on about. So quite means a lot in American. So that is one worth bearing in mind. But in terms of the swearing, I went to the high priest of swearing, Ian Martin, who was originally listed as the swearing consultant on The Thick of It, and then obviously went on to write for Veep. And things, writing for Veep and The Thick of It, he really is a very mm. proficient swearer translator. As he says, they don't swear, they curse the Americans, which he likes because it sounds like you're actually cursing someone with bad language. So sometimes you might want to have a British word, something like In the Loop, which has got some British, some American characters. You just, you just sat there like, what do you British say? a wanker and it sounded great with a sort of horrible little sarcastic air quotes he thought that in the sort of US UK linguistic you know bureau de change two dicks for a cock so okay. like, there's a lot of you say a lot of dicks in American but you'd have to produce cock more more rarely really yes this is they're, what he, no, so they're, listen, more, he, they're more dick friendly than cock friendly yes I would say so As some okay. some stuff doesn't like travel culturally so um when Selena Mayer says, don't give me that Quaker in a titty bar look, which he, obviously, as Ian points out, would sound a bit different if Judy Dench said it and you <laughs> couldn't quite couldn't quite understand what was happening. Sometimes things just totally read across. So you dim fucking bulb could be said in mm -hmm. Veep, could be said in the thick of it, could be said in Abbey Everyone knows what's going on. Um, but in general, you have to do, you do have to think particularly on swearing, which ones work and which ones don't, and whether they get the sort of swearing references. Um, and it's quite a big thing because that will be the moment that it will really jar. You know, as I say, if you see British characters in British accents saying ass, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's embarrassing in some way. And, you know, it doesn't work. So you have to be quite careful on that. Yeah, in the American uh, um, edits of, of the Thursday Murder Club books on We Solve Murders, I always find it interesting. Very, very little really needs to be um, translated. And, you know, I write a lot of sort of parochial, very British things. And actually the American readers, if they don't know the reference, that that's kind of fun. Like we will watch The Simpsons and they'll talk about I'm fascinated Rory, by this. Rory Calhoun. And you go, well, I don't know who that is. But I, I, I like, know the kind of guy he is. I like the sound of the name and I understand yeah. the, the sort of thing. That very, very occasionally, like and I think in the very first book I talked about John Lewis, uh, yeah. And that made no sense to them because it doesn't sound like a shop. And John Lewis no. was a very famous senator. So they, they said, could we change that? And you go, yeah, of course you can. But the only real problem they had at, at one point, normally they're very, very good. They said, um, we don't understand this bit. There's a character called Ron in the books. We don't understand this bit. Has, has Ron killed someone? And I was like, huh? Because there's a scene, did Ron kill someone? I go, no. He goes, there's a scene here. It says, uh, Ron goes for a slash in the woods. And I was like, okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I see. I see where we've got there. So that we changed. Oh, I but, love uh, this. But uh, yeah, you don't. So you, does Greg so, stay in as an example? Greg stays in. They have no the, access to Greg's or the, universal the, healthcare. The Amer <laughs> you know, it's the two tragedies of American life. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, the two sort of cancel each other out a little bit though. Yeah. <laughs> See, it's a Japanese edition. Are there yeah. footnotes in the Thursday Murder Club saying... The Chinese one is literally it's all footnotes. It's all... Really? Literally, it's so thick and half of it is footnotes explaining who Nigella is and... Who the <laughs> oh, 
Oh my god, this is so cool. Bikers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All of that. I want one of the translation of the footnotes and how they actually describe them to non-English speakers. Oh, I, I really yeah. want that. It's for you know, just like a page. It will say, it will say, you know, reference forty-seven, Nigella Lawson. Reference forty-eight, I love a bonus. Reference forty-nine, Holmes under the hammer. You're like, <laughs> you're like, oh man, that's really is that? Did I, did I write all that on one page? Uh, and so yeah, but it, but by and large, I think Americans quite quite enjoy but this reading is why your British mom- slang said i think your books his books be really good for people that who don't know english which sounds like a bit of a <laughs> diss said, yeah it was a diss she said that, <laughs> that they'd be perfect for people learning english as a foreign language but also <laughs> like a replicant coming to our country and having to pass as someone who yeah. can like talk about like the clutch on a voxel course uh, yeah on Homes Under the Hammer and can just somehow pass as a, you know, as a humanoid. Well, we were talking about Nick Harkaway's brilliant John le Carre uh, novel. And actually, yeah, if you were a Hungarian spy coming to England, yeah, just read the Thursday Murder Club books. You're, honestly, you're, you, you can have pretty much yeah. any conversation you want. There's even football stuff in there. Yeah, complain you know? about a meal deal. Yeah, complain about a meal deal and say who, who is the best captain West Ham ever had. You know, done. is it Bobby Moore? Is it Billy Bonds? Is it Mark Noble? You know, that's all. That literally, Arguably Blade Runner would have been a different film if they'd used that as a way of passing. But listen, anyway, we continue. Who's the best captain West Ham ever had? Mark Noble. We're done. I have a question here from Evan Green, who asks: I've heard rumours that certain actors are fed lines through earpieces on set. Is this true? If so, how frequently does this happen, and is it on the rise? That is a good question. They're called earwigs, the little thing. And someone could, if you haven't bothered learning your lines, be telling you them just as you're about to say it. It is only able to happen if you're mega big. Yeah. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. does it, by <sighs> the way. Yeah. Other actors really don't like it, by the way. If they know yeah. that someone's acting with an earwig, they think it's really disrespectful. They've learned their lines and they don't really like, you know, some people, Robert Downey Jr. claims it's part of his process. Mm, that's clever. Yeah, because and actually, what he also says is, I don't like learning lines because I want to spend more time with my family. So I mean, you know, you're only being paid like a hundred million quid here or something. Do you mind? Wow, part, yeah. of pro- part of my process is I don't like to get up before ten a.m. Yeah, part it's of- just it's how I get into character. Yeah. Marlon Brando did a lot. I mean, in The Godfather, he didn't have an earwig. Honestly, other actors had um, the cue cards like stuck on them, so if they were. <laughs> being shot from behind for his coverage when the cameras as we talked about coverage before when the cameras just on him for those cutaways in the scene they had like the, the his lines stuck to them i mean it's quite you know you can see why people don't like that either um <laughs> but again you know he's indispensable there's something called the lost soul the doomed journey of richard stanley's island of dr moreau you can watch it on youtube and that is a story of a sort of idealistic filmmaker who's going to make this movie um, about quite a dark and weird book and it goes so wrong he goes really quite mad it's a really good documentary if you want to watch that one but Brando turns up on that I mean just if you don't want to watch the documentary just google Marlon Brando costume Island of Dr Moreau you've never seen anything like it. he's wearing a sort of beekeeper's hat he's it's extraordinary for that one again he had to have it all done via an earwig and wouldn't do it um it, Johnny Depp in the later parts of the Caribbean I'm afraid I think he was just quite wasted the whole time he he was doing that. My favourite one of it, though, is Rita Ora is in Fifty Shades of Grey. I mean, she had it for four lines. <laughs> she's got four lines in the whole film. I think she's Christian Grey's sister. She is Christian Grey's sister. And she's got it for four lines. But she had an earwig for that because she said, oh, no, I just couldn't possibly. It's like, but you wow. can learn your, like, all your songs. It, I guess it's just you're in a different milieu. She is yeah. a star in another, in another milieu. And... As I say, you have to be mega important. I wouldn't say it is on the rise. I don't know whether it's on the rise mm. or not. There are so few actors you can really get away by just saying, I am doing this. Yeah. Especially because nobody else likes it. Yeah, exactly. I, I do think there's one sort of slight caveat, which is sometimes older actors uh, yes, will, will have it. lines just so they're there, just so they know they're there because you'd have spent a whole lifetime learning lines, but they just get to the point where they go... I- Okay, I just, do you know yeah. what? I want just a little prompt sometimes. Or you'll have words. A security blanket, rendered, of knowing a, it's there is enough often to. A security blanket. And of course, any actor like that, of course, they absolutely do what they want because they prove what they can do time and time again. And it's just something that uh, that, that they need. But it's, um, yeah, that's, oh, I didn't know that. A little earpiece. Yeah, earwig. Wow, an earwig. That's cool. Good question. I often find myself watching one of the many series and spin offs of Below Deck, currently Below Deck Mediterranean. I'm curious, apart from the draw of being on TV, what is in it for the guests to book a charter on a boat with the show, which are super yachts, by the way? Do they get a discount for possibly being portrayed as a nuisance and crew swarming all over the boat? This show is a new obsession in my house. My daughter's watched it for ages. Now now my wife is watching it and therefore I am watching it. And it's really good. 
I mean, it's really it it, it sort of feels almost like um, the end pro- times. The producer, no, not end times. It's re- I love it. It feels that the, the producer gets less involved in this than, than they would yeah. do on on certain other shows. But funnily enough, my daughter asked exactly this question, which is. Why are people doing it? Are they getting it cheaper or because not? The sums for these boats are absolutely oh. enormous. Sometimes when we go on holiday in Corfu, lots of them come past, and we're always like looking at them with the binoculars and then immediately googling how much it costs to rent a week, and it's insane. It's like hundreds of thousands yeah, yeah. of pounds. It's, it really it's is absolutely mad. Uh, and so the show, you know, people charter it. You get like eight or ten people. There'll be like family groups or you know work groups or something like that. And so the crew are always there. So you follow, you know, the captain, you follow the engineers, you follow the, you know, the the, the, the people working on the ship. And it's just each new episode, there's a new group of yeah. um, people coming in. Uh, and so you've got the soap opera of the crew, but you've also got every week new people to, to judge, yeah. uh, which I think is the... Uh, story of the week. The joy of the show, story of the week, exactly that. Um, now, Mark Cronin, who created Below Deck, answered our question for us. He says this, Guests get a 50% discount on the three-day charters and get their flights paid for, but guests still have to pay for all of their food, any excursions, and of course, the all-important tip, which is a big deal on yeah. Below Deck. Yeah. 12 grand the guy gave him uh, uh, on the, the one I was watching last night. Uh, and that is expected to be 50 to 20% of the total cost. So for the honour of being a side character for one episode of uh, of Below Deck, you'll be paying about £45,000 for three nights. For your holiday? Yeah. To have being filmed, uh, you're good. It's just so mind blowing. People really want to be on TV, don't they? Yeah, and they will risk paying 50 grand to look like an utter arsehole. Well, I, you're gonna have to explain it to me. Well, if I, I suppose if, if, if you are interested in hiring a super yacht anyway, then you, you might have a certain personality type. Uh, and if you had that certain, do you pers- think they don't realize they're assholes? So they don't realize they're paying. 50 well, a lot grand. of assholes don't realize that they're assholes, no, do they? That's, they're that's fifty grand to be themselves. That's 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 the very point of it. Um, so I I think that yeah, uh, honestly, I think if you are trying to impress a group of people, or if you do have a family holiday, imagine if you're sitting down now, so look, the whole the family's got to get together. We're going to have ten of us, and what should we do? We're going to have, have a week somewhere, uh, and three or four of you watch and like below deck. Actually, if you said, well, why don't we go on below deck? You, you, you might, well, we're going to spend some money anyway on our holiday. We're stupidly rich anyway, and we waste our money anyway. This might be a fun way to waste that money. Oh, my God. People like to be on TV. But they don't realise what TV involves. They come across quite bad. A lot of them come across quite badly. Probably because they're so annoyed they've had to do the same thing. They, You know, let's be honest, this is like managed reality. So they've probably had to do the same seen asking for the espresso martini about five times and then they there's there must be cables everywhere tripping over them yeah. but i mean it, i just don't understand but they it. also leave in all the bits where every single guest tries to sleep with every single member of the crew yeah like every night at the end when they've had a few i think drinks. that's mandatory yeah but it's like you just think you know that there's a camera looking at you when you do that all i knew about below deck in the olden days was uh, that kate from us traitors was in it uh, yeah and watching her and here, she is a monster yeah but she's but, good, uh, my monster yeah but, she's, she's but, very good at her job <laughs> I would say that. So yeah, pe- people are paying an, a lot of money, and the, the tip is for real and all that kind of stuff. And the people who've seen it know the tips can often, often be absolutely huge, uh, you know. And the crew is real and all that stuff. As I say, as a new convert to it, I don't believe it's end times. I quite think it's quite an enjoyable bit of television, but very expensive. It turns out to to, to be on. There can't be many other shows that you're paying to be on. God, what a sucker! I they, they think they they've won these people, but they have they haven't. They've lost. But, but well, it depends what game they're playing. <laughs> Is the game I look like a dickhead on television? Because if, okay, in which case they've aced it. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Sky, who are proud partners of The Rest is Entertainment, where you can watch Sky Originals, including Sweet Pea, a darkly comic thriller starring Ella Purnell. Marina, do you like coming of age stories? I certainly do, Richard. Uh, how about a coming of rage story? Okay, yes, please. That's clever, isn't it? Uh, well, Sweet Pea is a twisted coming of rage story, as you say, starring Ella Purnell, who people might know from Yellow Jackets, Fallout, uh, Fallout. as well. Unbelievable actor. Uh, she's Rhiannon, a quiet wallflower turn serial killer. Uh, so her life is pretty mundane at the beginning of it. She continuously yeah. is overlooked by her boss. Her long-standing crush ignores her. A uh, high school bully has resurfaced uh, and her dad is really sick. Then suddenly everything in her life is turned upside down. The wallflower is gone and it's place a young woman capable of anything. 
Can she keep her killer secret? I can't wait to see this. I, I love any form of, uh, yes, anyone just finally having had enough and losing it. Yeah, if you're looking for a thriller with a great bit of dark comedy, which is exactly what this is, it's uh, unpredictable. Rhiannon's kill list keeps growing. No one is safe. But the big question is, will she get caught? It's funny. It's very, very dark. The performances uh, are, are extraordinary. It's strongly recommended. Uh, so watch uh, Sky Original Sweet Pea from 10th of October on Sky. Marina, a question from Grace Revel. I was wondering why so many series seem to have a certain number of episodes and why is it always an even number? Since streaming, I'm not quite sure that... that I've, I've worked on a show, Avenue 5, and that had nine episodes, but that was actually because the set partially burnt down, so we went from 10 oh, really? to 9. But the second season had nine as well. Last of Us, I think that was nine. Baby Reindeer was seven. But that was the thing about streaming, that first of all, when it you know House of Cards came out, and I think... Orange is the New Black, they were sort of new things for um, Netflix and they were 13 each. It was sort of, suddenly you didn't have to mm. fit these little blocks that had been there since time immemorial. And also, if you didn't want to make it an hour long, you could make it 62 minutes. It didn't matter. You weren't. Yeah. And it, so it's weird. Binging has actually led to shorter seasons because people wanted to kind of do it all in one. If you said to them, right, there's now 22 episodes of Lost to watch. Mm. Anything you watch on streaming does not have to be equal numbers and isn't anymore at all. So it doesn't matter in the same way that it used to. It doesn't not. And of course, if you actually look at um, miniseries, lots of things have a three one hours. So we have a lot of that. I'm not convinced, but now anything can be anything really if, in a much more loose way than it ever was before. Yeah, but in the in the older days when you know we had uh, five terrestrial television channels, you know they're each filling 52 weeks a year, and they they would do that in very very structured blocks, and they would be planning 18 months in advance, and so they would know exactly what's fitting where, and so they would traditionally understand that if a sitcom was coming that would be six weeks and would yep. take up six weeks of their time and so it was just one of those things that got written into the dna of television i think is the truth and you know then producers started to understand how to make six episodes and writers understood that as well and some of that by the way is to do if you spent lots of your budget and there were certain uh, like earlier episodes on something like doctor who where you could see they've had a really expensive mm. um episode and the next one they're all going to be kind of locked in a crypt or something which is a lot cheaper to make yeah if you uh, if you ever see an episode of any sitcom or anything where it's just the two characters and they're and yeah they're they're locked in a bank vault uh it's because look yeah. what happened earlier on or later because that will be very an expensive yeah. episode is either that just happened or is coming up exactly that but then you know it was be 52 weeks and so you would cut that down and you know you'd have a huge thing probably up on the wall in the old days where you would sort of block in what was going where and so six weeks or eight weeks or ten weeks was just a, a very simple thing to work with across 52 weeks of the year but um yeah it just came from that really but as you say with streamers they don't have to worry about when you watch something they don't have to worry about fitting something else in the following week so they can just do exactly what they want when they want weirdly as a as, as a producer and writer you still a bit of you still going well presumably this will be six or eight episodes yeah because there's just there's something that just you know there's there's a hangover from from those olden days and if someone says well we could do seven you're like oh i seven really yeah oh, i don't know about that um and then also that confuses people who are watching because when you get to episode six of any drama on tv you do have to go on imdb and see if this is the last episode and yeah. you go oh no okay there's nine there's ten and it's so it but it's um yeah it, it it's just one of those things that, that that has always been and was because things used to have to be commissioned just absolutely in chunks and now yeah i suspect the odd numbers are having their day i think it's great but it's great for storytelling if you can if you think well actually you know we want to just can we have an extra episode out of this sometimes in the right and also can we cut it down can it yeah. not be six can it can it be five can it be or, or and if or, as something like baby reindeer seven that's a, a perhaps that's less conventional but if if it just works then it's great to be able to do that now and to not feel that there's got to be slack episodes or something where it didn't quite work and you think yeah that should have been pushed together or, or divided into two the traditional thing you used to do on panel shows and and what have you if they commissioned six or eight or ten or whatever is you'd always be kind of you know stocking up the off cuts of various episodes that you had to cut out for time and you would do a, a bonus episode or would i like to I think do two bonus episodes um each time, it just means that, you know, 10 episodes become 12. And it's one of the few shows, what I like to you, where the bonus episode are just absolutely sensationally brilliant. Yeah. So normally on a show, when the bonus episode comes out, we think, oh, okay. But with what I like to you, just think, oh, wait, this yeah, is going to be a series of amazing stories. 
Chris Hudson says, very occasionally when a celebrity appears on a game show, they will state they don't know the rules or have never watched the show Mm. show before. Their lack of understanding can be entertaining, but is it really possible that no one in the production team has explained it? Yes, quite often if you do celebrity versions of shows, um, yeah, people will not have watched the show before. I sort of get it. Uh, And um, I look poorly on it. I no. Point the celebrities, I think, because there's eight of them and sometimes people bring along a partner. So it's not always the case that everyone has uh, has, has seen the show. They just It's a booking that's come through their agent. Well, you're have an anxiety dream, just turn up on a show, you've got no idea what could happen to you. Yeah, but the thing is that that's not how some people's brains work. Some people are like, oh, yeah, God, yeah what do you need me to do? Where do you need me to stand? What are you saying to me now? Uh, yeah, it's like, you're right, yeah. it's better to be that person. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and yes, every time you come on a show, you are given a, an extensive briefing about how the rules of the show work. You're given an extensive briefing about how round one might work, how round two might work. The truth is p- people are not listening. People either watch the show already, in which case they get the rules, or they haven't watched the show because it's not the sort of thing for them and that they do not understand what you were saying to them. It's the same with normal contestants. You know, I've always said a million times, viewers at home as well, the, for years, people say you've got to explain the rules, explain the rules, explain the rules. Either people understand the rules, or they're never going to understand the rules, and they don't really mind. They just watch. They're just watching it and want to answer the questions. So um, we had uh, Jedward have been on a few times. Uh, <laughs> We were walking. We were walking along the river in Richmond the other day, and these two youths on bicycles sort of skidded by, uh, and they go, "Richard, Richard," uh, and then we turn around and it was Jedward, and that was so. Oh my so god, they come I love that they're just yeah. out there on their BMXs, yeah, on their BMXs, BMXs <laughs> essentially, uh, and um, they, they are, live the brand. They, I mean, they, I mean, they, truly, they really do, yeah. and they, they're always an absolute delight to talk to. Anyway, they 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 came on the show, and I always remember um, in their briefing, their man. <laughs> The manager said to them, they said, boys, it points to their mouth. He goes, you got one of those, points to their ears, you got two of those. So listen more than you talk. He said, <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say in primary classrooms. Yeah, but, you know, know, again, yeah, it's, yeah, the brand, listen, it's the brand. Listen, I, I absolutely get it. Um, and so, yeah, so everyone gets every single rule explained to them at all times. But most people are absolutely not listening. In the same way that if you stop, so, if, you know, if you stop someone for directions, you say, you know, how do I get to the SO garage? And they go, oh, so you go up here, turn left, then it's the third right, and then you get the about and there's a second uh after that and then you just take a quick sharp left and you'll see it there and me and i would say 80 percent of people stop listening after you go up here and turn left yeah. you think well i'll go up here and turn left and ask someone else because I'm, I'm i'm not hearing the rest of it but yeah often yeah sometimes you'll have people on the show and they don't understand where they are i would say almost always they get knocked out very very quickly there's something about someone who has no interest in what the rules are and no curiosity about the show they're on that also means their general knowledge is not always where it might be I would say. So, you know, often they don't last too long. An appearance fee for not even bothering to read the rules. No, I, they should be knocked out. I know, but then if, you were, if you've only got six contestants on a Monday morning and you're filming in an hour's time, <laughs> you're like, you know what, whoever you got, bring them on. <laughs> also, some shows are quite complicated. If you really had to explain pointless in 10 minutes to yes. someone, it would be quite hard to do. It's the truth. House of Games is lovely. House of Games, the briefing we do uh, on House of Games, I always really, really enjoy because it's just me going, there is absolutely no point me telling you what's going to happen because (laughs) it is every single round is different. At the start of each round, I'll tell you a rough idea of what's going on. If you don't understand, we'll do one question and you'll get it. And so it's it's like an anti-briefing and it makes for much more fun for everybody. I like on House of Games where you get to the end of the round and someone in seat three will go, oh, I get it now. I, I understand what we've been doing for the last five minutes. And it's, uh, you know, it's, di- it's different brains, you know, react to different things. But so you just sit there and answer the questions is usually the uh, is usually the thing to do. But pointless is funny because people go, sorry, am I trying to get the lowest answer? You go, yeah, we've literally been here for the last hour. And that's, that's what everyone's been doing. the last however many years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, I have a little earpiece sometimes in House of Games. And we, we do a round called The Nice Round where you get the name of a film or a book and you have to write down one word yeah. to, um, to, to to help one of your fellow contestants uh, get it. And every, every time it starts, uh, Tom or Abby who are in my ear just go, yeah, just one word. Because every single time everyone says, just one word. Is it just one word? Like every single time. I've never, <laughs> ever done it without someone going, is it just one word? And so, so, but so, listen. R- rules are rules, but uh, it's fun if people know them. But if they don't know, them, they usually get knocked out fairly quickly. Richard, this is about the We Solve Murders audio book from Katie Bateman. She oh, says, that's a good name. I yeah. like a name that's got an internal rhyme. Katie Bateman has got that. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Listen, <laughs> Thank I'm, you for your name. Yeah. And also for your question, which that is, that's all we have time for. <laughs> 
Her question is, I'm partially sighted, so I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I've recently been listening to the audiobook of We Solve Murders, read brilliantly by Nicola Walker. Mm. It got me wondering, how are audiobook readers chosen and do authors get a say in the matter? Thank you, Katie. Yeah, she's she's amazing, Nicola Walker. Yeah. Uh, I'm the same because I'm, I'm visually impaired. I listen to, a, a, you know, I can get through printed books but it takes me a long time so i love having an audiobook on the go at any given time katie um you do get the choice well certainly um certainly i've had a choice a lot of authors read their own audiobooks um and people if you're mark binningham who is a stand-up as well as a brilliant writer it's great he knows yeah. exactly he knows exactly what the voice of the characters is his main character in lots of his books tom thorne you sort of feel is, is binningham-esque yeah. anyway so that that makes absolute sense because my books are, are sort of i would say female-led i felt it was inappropriate for me to read them also i just i just get out of I, it i can't act you know it'd just be <laughs> awful and also i'd want to rewrite as i was going through i just yes. I, I don't think i could do it um and so you know there there are some people who do audiobooks and you can listen to the you know versions of them but with Thursday Murder Club we sat down and made a list of people we'd like I wanted it to be someone who's slightly older and so there's Emmanville and Fiona Shaw were both on that list and they both done two each and did it absolutely brilliantly and it's so important because they have to get the spirit of a book you know if you're listening as Katie will tell you if you're walking around with that person's voice in your head all day and it, so it becomes yeah. you know it's, it's incredibly important that it's intimate but that it also gets across the drama and the comedy of the book um, and both of those do brilliantly so with We Solve Murders um, because it, there's a character called Amy who is slightly younger and a, a lot of it sort of goes through Amy I wanted someone who was slightly younger but someone also who's you know people know for kind of murdery type things but also has done comedy and Nicola Walker of course ticks all of those um boxes and so we went for Nicola Walker and she said yes and the lovely thing is that they they then ring you and talk to you about the book and they talk to you about some of the characters and they say oh, I was thinking of doing this and maybe does this character do that and so there's a lovely back and forth between wow. audio reader and um author I think in the future there's going to be an awful lot of and there are already some yeah. AI read books and if you ever listen to one, it's sort of you can't, you just can't do it because everything is too flattened. And again, if you've got that voice in your ear the whole time, it would it would drive you yeah. absolutely mad. I think you know if you can find someone who can read an audiobook in a great way, then you just hold on to them forever because it's it just makes your book more magical. Yeah. And so yeah, I've been very very lucky with Leslie Manville, then Fiona Shaw, and now Nicola Walker. But yeah, you 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 do get the choice. You certainly ask for someone you know, or if you've heard someone before in in, in your ear, you you kind of look for them. Anne Patchett, I'm always I always think is amazing because she had um, Tom Hanks reading one, and then the next one was Meryl Streep. Do you think that's pretty good going? Isn't that's it? That's wonderful. There are certain books that I hear in when I'm reading them. I hear them being read to me by, I, I always mm. imagine when I'm reading Woodhouse, and I actually ended up telling Hugh Laurie this, I just said, I, it's because you've, you, I just imagine you reading the books to me. And because I suppose I saw the his Jeeves and yeah. Worcester, you know, a relatively young age, that was probably in my teens. I imagine him reading them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear the voice in my head. He is, might as well have done the audiobook. I don't know if he has done the audiobook, but I've always felt that way. And I, and I told him that. He said, I can't actually read that. I feel I'm sort of take, you know, taking wood house. But I said, no, I hear you reading them to me. That's and funny. I, I, I did a uh, the book show Between the Covers on BBC Two recently, and Ben Miller was on. Uh, and he said that, that he, and since you said this, I've asked other people and other people do it. He says that he reads the book at the same time as listening to the audiobook. So he has the audiobook talking while he reads the words in the book. Oh. Can you believe that? I can't. I yeah. don't I have not heard that before. Is that that will be a whole thing. It'll be like the whole yeah. subtitle. We'll have opened a can of worms with this. It'll be a whole subtitles discussion. Yeah. I'd like to hear more from people who also do this. Because I will sometimes have the book and I'll have the audiobook. And if I'm out for a walk, I'll yeah, be listening and, and then I'll turn to the bit in the book I've got yeah. to. I, I, I sort of get that. But no, he literally sits reading the book and has the audiobook on at the same time. So it does both at the same time. If you do this, please write in yeah, and explain why. The address is the rest is entertainment <laughs> at gmail.com. And I definitely want to hear from you. Uh, I think that's us done, is it? I think it is. Um, don't forget those uh, those tickets for the Royal Albert Hall show are out now for members and they're out tomorrow for uh, non-members. We'd love to see you there. Um, rest is entertainment.com for all the details. But... Um, all that aside, perhaps we'll see everyone next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Bye.